work session. Up first, we've got the K-1 update community engagement. Mayor Wilson. Uh, yes, and I will invite uh, Jessica. You want to come on? Um, I will tell you that it's listed twice on there. There's just one, one agenda item, so I think this is going to go by really, really fast, unless people have questions. Um, but basically, um, when we knew we were going to purchase, which, by the way, it's going to happen, I think, Friday mm -hmm. at, do you know what time? One o'clock. One o'clock. Um, we're going to have, like, a little ceremony at the K-1 Center. So if y'all can make it, please do so. But um, with today's um, technology and expertise in gathering uh, collaborative community engagement, the City of Fairhope must always provide a platform for which to share ideas. Uh, with our citizens and, and, and vice versa, especially when it comes to um, decisions that affect the city long term. Um, what the K-1 Center could become in its second life should come from the people who were purchasing it, the taxpayers. There was a lot of talk before from different interest groups with their ideas, all very good, and but, but there was not a formal process for all to share their ideas to make certain all were being considered. I felt it was critical to set up this process for our community to contribute their ideas and make certain citizens are part of the process until the end. We were fortunate that Amy Chester with Rebuild by Design was available. She was in town for a resiliency conference and she was the one that facilitated the, the initial three hour engagement meeting um, here at the Civic Center. And this was followed up with a survey. The engagement process is not finished. This is uh, just going over some, some high point ideas. And the point of uh, starting the initial phase was to determine general concepts. So these are not, doesn't have anything to do with the building structure, um, any of the details. This is just concepts right now. Um, the process will include um, more community conversations, research, and workshops in order to provide most, the most innovative plans for the site's future. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Jessica, who is going to go over, um, well, she has a lot to go over, but the survey is one of them. So thank you. Thanks for having me this afternoon, gentlemen. So. You know, the mayor was talking about the forum that we had in April. Um, we called it the Fair Hope K-1 Center, What Do You See? Because we really wanted to, to facilitate this positive, inclusive environment where people didn't feel like their ideas would get, you know, smushed down or, or taken advantage of. We wanted people to feel like they were definitely part of the process. It was the first step in what we hope will be an, an extensive community engagement process. We had more than 100 participants that day so we have more than 100 participants that day. Um, and the discussion was modeled after Rebuild by Design's processes. So the small, table, small group table discussions prompted by Amy Chester, um, they were facilitated by local community members who had gone through some, uh, some training with us the previous day. Participants were asked to talk about the challenges and strengths and the things they really love about Fair Hope. And they were also asked to create individual table vision statements. Those vision statements were then voted on by all participants and kind of whittled down to the top four, if you will. So what you'll see in these slides is that those collective strengths, weaknesses, and loves, and vision statements are kind of the basis of what this survey was built on. The survey was, the content design was advised by Rebuild by Design and Amy Chester. They had a, an integral part in putting that survey together. Um, so what you see up there is we asked uh, people to vote on their loves. These were the top five loves that came out of that April meeting. Um, and as you can see, without a doubt, small town feel was number one. That was the thing they loved the most about our community. You also see significance of history and walkability, Mobile Bay, cultural and educational opportunities. Um, some of the comments entered into this survey by residents were that they were pretty interesting, but everybody said that this is a completely different place from other places. That's what they want to preserve is the fair hope is completely different. They also want to preserve the friendliness and cohesiveness that they feel in our community. They see those as major pluses to this city. Um, 
Overwhelmingly, but not surprisingly, rapid growth was the most challenging our residents believe we face, um, followed pretty quickly by environmental stressors. Many comments were left within that survey speaking to the challenge of growth, with one respondent's answer kind of summarizing all of them by saying, too much growth is ruining our beautiful town. Um, there were about 500 people who responded to this, uh, and I would say that a majority of that was the comments that were left were by people who said that growth was ruining our town. Um, on the other hand, the least challenging of the options the participants voted on were opportunities for civic engagement and space for performing arts. Uh, other options there you see were lack of parking and environmental stressors. We also asked participants to rank four options for what they would like to see on the K-1 site. And interestingly enough, they were evenly split between a space for environmental stewardship and a space for arts and culture. Comments entered into in this section uh, were the most plentiful and were definitely creative, uh, as is Fairhope's signature, with suggestions from everything to open green space and the arts to environmental research and education, an area enha for enhanced civic engagement for children, uh, and endless combination use options. So more than anything, this survey, similar to the April meeting, is a representation of a community that desires to work together for a common good and a common purpose. What you see now are uh, vision statements, or you were going to see some vision statements, but for some reason they are not loaded up there. Um, but our vision statements were voted on by our respondents, and they were pretty evenly split between people who want to see civic engagement, a space that is mixed use, that has combined use for civic engagement and arts and education and culture. Uh, we, are, we have such an advantage with this space in the middle of our central business district. And we know that the K-1 Center evokes memories and nostalgia, but more than that, respondents showed overwhelmingly that the, the property is full of possibilities, and our citizens see that full of possibilities, both nostalgic and otherwise, for a more vibrant central business district. Um, we want to thank all the citizens who took the time to let their voices be heard for this. All right. And we're going to have this also in more detail, the whole slide yeah. with additional yeah, notes. Yeah, I'm not really sure what happened to the slide, sorry. With additional notes, do you want to do the uh, mission statements or which one? Yeah, we will actually put those out. So okay. we're hoping to put those out on the website tomorrow. Just kind of a summary of this so that um, residents can see what their fellow residents voted on. They really took the time, the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's possible, but I would love to see sort of the raw data that came with Yeah, those. I would love so to be able to provide that the, to you guys. Some of the responses that we actually got. For sure, yeah. and they're so fascinating. You know if you, um, if it works for you guys, I would love to be able to email you yeah, just kind of the raw data from it yeah, so that you see it. It's a, um, it's a lot, but you know what? That's what we need when we're talking about community engagement. Every citizen's <laughs> voice matters. So, Is that something we can post to, I mean, on the website? It may be okay. difficult to do okay. that, but we can definitely look into it. I can speak okay. with Jeff about that. <clears throat> okay. Well, great. That's Any why I said, questions? you know, I had no idea that this was going to be the only thing on the agenda. Because yeah, I see it just when else. everybody else says, <laughs> but, you know. Okay. Yeah, Thank I know we all. have a harbor yeah. board Thank item, too, but I can't. Too terribly long. All right. That is item number one and number two, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing? Yes, it is. All right. Well, so. I, I just had one. Uh, so. Number three. We got, come on, guys. Like I said, we appreciate taking one of those out. So we'll exactly. I mean. <coughs> As the as the agenda item um, <coughs> states, what what I, what we're this is um, Don Bates, who's the newest member of the Harbor Board, and I'm the chairman this year. Um, we have been discussing, and you all have too, the use of the Fly Creek property, besides just being a, a collection of boat wet slips like we've got now. And what we seem to have established is a lot of people have different ideas about the highest and best use. But none of us really have any specific experience into, into relating the highest and best use of a marina to what we've got in Fairhope. So the, the uh, Harbor Board voted last time to, to, ask, to uh, permit me to come ask you all 
if we could initiate a process to hire a consultant to, to help us determine what the options would be for the use of the property and um, it would give us a list, <coughs> give you all a list of choices along with economic um, benefits and consequences of those choices. But I'm, I'm, I'd like to make a couple of other remarks, but first I want to thank the council and um, especially Kevin who sits through our meetings, Lynn Mazur, uh, Tom Cool, and, and Sean Say who have, have up to this point done a really great job on bringing what we've got there now back from almost ruined to usable space. So, but so far things have gone really well. It's a great piece of property and I think we can do a lot with it. Um, Don is he's new on the harbor board and he's fairly new in fair Oak, but i think he had some comments that he shared with me that i think it'd be interesting for you all to hear on his idea about what we could do sure sure thank y'all thank you for your time uh yeah 14 years ago we got married on the bluffs of fair hope my wife said get me to fair hope so five years ago we came to fair hope and uh, then skip has been roping me into things ever since um so you know uh, two years i've had a boat in in the marina and first of all, just amazing what two years has done for that facility. Mm -hmm. Sean's working super hard, getting the support, and it really is a, you know, even loopers that are coming through have stopped and talked about what a nice place and why would you not come to Fairhope, why you can shop and do everything else. So uh, as part of this, I guess, a uh, fourth meeting on the board. Uh, and we kind of go in the definition of insanity. Let's make it a boat yard, let's land space. I mean, it's just the gamut of ideas. Uh, and it's just has come up it's time for the vision uh, going forward and so as a as a group uh, you know we have a lot of opinions without the experience and and skip brought the concept to let's get to something as close to apples and apples not necessarily just a pure cost standpoint but something that aligns with the long-term vision of Fairhope um, and that's what I feel that we're tasked to do if we're going to be an active group uh, to put that into something that's simple planable and we can set future plans with and so I think what what Skip's going to propose really lets us put something that we can put in your hands to help us with that decision and we can help implement uh, that vision going forward. Um, I've had conversations with two um, marina consultants um, they both uh, actively operate marinas and ship and ship building facilities and they're both willing to undertake a, a consulting look at what we're doing. I've, I've talked more to one guy, Jim Bronstein, who's in Miami, and he responded to, an, in fact, I met him and visited with him here in Fairhope. He's on the board of Saunders Yacht Works. Um, he sent me back, uh, we talked a little bit about what he might bring to the table in terms of um, information and experience and suggestions, and, and then he, and we discussed what what we can do, the city can do. The city's got some, our departments are capable of doing a lot of stuff and coming up with, with the um, cost. I mean, we don't have to hire somebody else to come in and tell us what it costs to do some of this stuff. And they can't tell us what we like best about Faro, but they can bring to the table their view of what's worked best in other places. Um, he, he said that what he thinks he could do for us uh, further evaluate physical site needs and layout options, including the wet slips and maybe dry storage. Evaluate the market and the surrounding competition, which is, I think, a really valuable insight because he, both of these guys see what goes on in marine environments all over the East Coast. Um, determine capital equipment needs uh, to, to accomplish various things. Evaluate the business models, including a boat yard, boat storage, contractor-based repair uh, opportunities, and leasing part are, are all of it. And, and evaluate the financial pro forma options about how any, any of these or a combination of these could benefit the city financially. Um, he said to do those things, more or less, he thinks he could do for about $10,000. My request at this point to you all would be, does it make sense, given that we've got a big facility with a lot of potential and a lot of different potential uses, 
that we get somebody who's done this before to come give us some suggestions in the neighborhood of 10,000 bucks. Now, I know that we've got, to, I would propose that we write a, a request for proposal and get it, get not just Jim Bronstein or this guy in North Carolina, but whoever wants to come help us respond to the request for proposal. But I don't want to get into that and involve city employees who've got a lot of other things to do if we just, you know, if you all are not interested, or if you don't agree that this is a good way for us to look at planning for that site. That's what I'm here today to ask if, if it does sound like a good way to do it, we're willing to take on the job of doing it with some help from, the, from city people who know a lot more about how to put an RFP together than I do. But I think it would really result in some good choices being given us and, and the financial um, results of making those choices. Um, so I would like to get you all to give us the go ahead to, to pursue the definition of what we're going to do with the help of somebody that's going to cost us a little bit of money to get the help. I'll, I'll go ahead and mention that the comprehensive land use plan is going to evaluate all assets with the community engagement. So I, I feel like this is kind of a little bit of a piecemeal in that regard because it's going to tie in every single one of our city assets, this being a big one, of course. And the teams that will be, you know, having the RFP, they're, they're going to be teams because it's all encompassing and all, all the experience will be there. But coastal engineering will be a big part of it, just like the one that we're going through right now. And uh, Councilman Conyers is, is, is with us on that. We're, we're interviewing teams for the uh, municipal pier living shoreline project that would start hopefully August or end of August we'll be getting those uh, bids back in so I mean I, I just when we look at it all encompassing and all of that experience being here we're going to have really the top notch in, in every category at our disposal so that, that's the that's the plan and that's really for, for all of our city assets because we, we want to have the experience from you know engineers of course environmentalists um and we'll have all of it well that sounds great but i'm i think what we're faced with here is the city has an asset here and we we don't know exactly what to do with it and what i'm proposing is that we get some help from people who do this every day for a living and i can't see i think it would be a part of what of what going to go on but I can't see any other resource other than somebody like this who would respond to an RFP who could bring the kind of information we need we, there are really different uses that can be made of that property one of which would just be make it a park surrounded by wet boat slips um, but I, I think community engagement does need to be involved as well. Right, exactly. But I think from your standpoint, you're making decisions based on the highest and best use of an asset, and that highest and best use should consider, does it financially benefit the city and does it benefit the ci citizens in, in Fairhope? The, the way it's constituted as an asset, are the citizens going to benefit from it, and, and can the city not make a profit maybe but can it can it be self-supporting and I think somebody who's in that business is is best suited to help us to, to show us what some of the options <coughs> are to create the past and best use if I can add to that skip so we're one level below I'm in the planning world my past business so the information that we get would really fit well with the master planning concept that the professionals you're talking about. It's one level below from a pro forma financial, very specific down one level that I think really fits into the process, very specific in the master planning process that you're talking about that allows, that says that, by the way, we actually have some real numbers here, you know, and I be think specific. That, that would so. be good, but like I said, this, it's a $650,000 study, it's 18 months. And the biggest component of it is citizen engagement. And it's gonna be very extensive. And I do think that all of our city property needs to be communicated that way before a plan's put together. I mean, that's just how I think. Well, I, I, it sounds like y'all are 
same thing. Saying the same thing. Right. Which y'all are, you know, it sounds like you're saying we want to see if this is the financial viability of, of, of how to operate the property as it exists, or maybe whether it needs to be changed to something mm -hmm. else. But you're saying before we could figure out what we need to do, we go to the what it says and input it. Right, because all of that might, would be might, part of it. But this that, can but give, the, might, and this is a critical part that. that we can actually give a lot more specificity to the citizens with the true option, because there's all these rumors. So I've been dealing with this for a couple months, and, oh, we're going to get $5,000 a month rent. Well, you talk to anybody with a boat yard, or that's the common number you hear out there, and anybody with a boat yard laughs that you're never going to get $5,000 a month rent plus tying into people's revenue. So I think this is a discussion item, you know, because we appreciate what you're saying. This, in the planning world, I think this could actually be a, for, the, for the amount of money for us as a holder board to really get it further along with the citizen involvement actually seeing the real numbers because you're going to have a lot of citizens say well there needs to be an operating boat yard because we can get five thousand dollars a month and that's what we've been doing for two years that exact thing i think we can get to that's not an option because we know there is nobody that will rent this facility for that amount and so that's just from what we're dealing with at our no, level no, but are you saying that you want to study for an entrepreneur then whether or not no, they can make a business no no, no. I, it I looks, think what we're suggesting that, is that we get some help in determining what the potential uses are from people who have designed designed marinas and waterfront property. Uh, how the citizens are going to make a decision about what they think is best if they don't know what the options are? No, and that's, that's why this is mm -hmm. part of the options too. I'm just saying that what we have in, in the plan is going to accomplish those things too. So. Mm -hmm. It's up to y'all if y'all want to do kind of it twice, but well, there's yeah. a lot of good effort going. I guess the, at the end of the day is the realistic side of what our current investment. We have two years of more work to do there that may not need to be done if we go a different route with the facility. For ten thousand dollars, I think we can have a better understanding of where we're going if we're talking about dry storage if that's the vision right now we're, we're investing in the things to bring it you know we, we haven't finished at all the, the money that needs to be invested in our uh, seawall upgrading our um, mm -hmm. boat slips I mean there's a lot to do before we even take it to the next phase the the boat yard I mean the the slips are self-sufficient right now which is remarkable just because it's been less than two years but I, I agree with you mm -hmm. it, you know there in order of priorities as far as the city there has to be an order of priorities it's one thing to do this study but the money that it will take to do some of these recommendations you know you have to look at it in a broader scope yeah well uh, I mean the way I hear this and the way I'm interpreting it at least and I, I'm gonna give you all a chance to comment y'all hadn't said anything yet is um, you know, citizen input is obviously going to be part of the land, the conference of land you study. Uh, and, and that will get a lot of input from citizens of Fairhope as to what they envision or what they'd like to see down there. But it sounds like what you guys are talking about is what is what is doable down there or what is viable down there. I mean, you know, I, I met with a, a group of eighth grade SGA students here a couple of, couple of months ago and, and they insisted that we get a Chick-fil-A in Fairhope. And so I don't know if that's a viable use for down there. <laughs> That would probably be the number one citizen input for a lot of those. Um, if the kids vote. And so, you know, knowing what, knowing what we want down there and then what's viable down there and what makes sense are two different things. And it sounds like you're talking about one piece and you're talking about another. And, maybe and, yours and priorities. Maybe that too. And yeah. priorities. But, yeah. um, but, but it sounds like you kind of need both to be able to make a reasoned decision. Um, um, yeah. I and, think now is the time to develop this kind of information so it can be put into the pot with the other stuff right. um, but here's, we, here's we also thought. need Let to consider staff's opinions too sure yeah I would like to get you know me personally I would say get citizen input first and staff's opinion about what to do with that property take a poll or whatever you need to do to, to find out what the citizen would like to see down there and then hire a, somebody to come in and say here's the best way to do that rather than paying this ten thousand dollars to this guy to come in and say it can be a working boat yard, it can be dry storage, it can be all these other things, and then we get to do the, get the citizens' input, and they say, no, we, you know, 95% of the people would rather see a pavilion park down there where they can go down there and picnic, then we've wasted $10,000, $10, I mean, it's not that much money in the scope of things, but we waste $10,000 in the process of getting 
this expert's opinion about what to put down there when that's not what the citizens want. Um, I guess one, one point I have, and this might be kind of being nitpicky, but if, if you went the route of leasing to an operator, I mean, you said Mr. Mr. Bronstein is, is on the board of, of um, Saunders, and I mean, they, they would be a phenomenal operator down there. I would just say, if we were to go that route, let's make sure we don't do anything where we somehow preclude them from being a potential candidate because we've conflicted them out. Oh, okay. Well, I'm, but, I'm, I get the, um, the impression that you all think we should hold off on this until until the citizens have said they want they, they want something different. I mean, I'd like to move forward, you know, to find out what's the best use, or best use according to the citizens, what they'd like to see down there. And if I could add, this specifically will not be his opinion on best use. His job is to get this as close to apples to apples of cost, long-term cost, maintenance, construction for all of the options, whether it's a part. It, we're not looking for his opinion. We're looking for him to use his experience to put this in something that we can all understand and do the long-term cost of all of this, not opinions, and that's the real goal. Of not this. just operation of a boat yard, but how much it would cost to convert it all to a park. And to a park, that's an option, no development. Option. Do we want to have, uh, that the city continues to operate it, and we have a select list of contractors, you know, and what those contractors will willingly pay and the way you deal with those contractors. So it's just the, the viable options that come out that other people can see, and it makes sense. That, that's really what it's about. We, we did uh, take out of the budget, and now I'm trying to think of how much it was in this, the 2019 budget for the, the upgrades that we need right now, and it's not all of them, but I thought it was like $400,000 that we didn't include. It was in the budget we had to take out. Those are the things that are critical that need to happen. So that's what I meant by the priorities right now. For the, It's going to cost a lot of money just to do what we need to do to make it a clean marina and sustainable. So hopefully we can include that in the 2020 budget. All right, well, we'll uh, wait to hear that. This will be a comprehensive study. And I'm, I'm happy to talk to you more about this study so you know that it does include a lot of things. And Thank you. Thanks, good. All right, item number four is committee updates. Councilman Conyers. All right, um, let's see. Uh, Historic Preservation Committee, they have um, created a draft ordinance for a forming a Historic Preservation Commission, which is the, the whole goal of the Historic Preservation Committee is to determine whether or not we need Historic Preservation uh, Commission. So I have circulated that uh, draft ordinance around just for review. And um, after you've had an opportunity to review it, not for discussion, but we can we can look at getting that on a work session agenda to discuss. Um, environmental advisory board. Uh, the last couple of meetings, I think they actually wound up being slightly short of a quorum. Um, there's some potential transition and uh, membership to that committee going on right now, but I've had lots of. Uh, I guess one-off conversations with um, individual members of the Environmental Advisory Board who, you know, had been asking about um, about the Dias Triangle and the conservation. So um, I know they would like to be involved or at least kept up to speed on that. And then the Library uh, Board, um, they're on on the agenda tonight, and I think that's uh, let's see, item number item number eight, and. Um, I think that that's something that's been uh, on their radar for quite a while, so they're very excited about that opportunity, and they may have some folks here to speak about that later. That's it. Thanks, sir. Robert? No updates. Kevin? Well, we were going to have a personnel board on the 18th, but we didn't have any actual items to comment on, so we didn't meet there, and you just heard the items on the harbor board, I suggested for the budget purposes for the money, but we may have to wait till next uh, and I don't have any updates 
tonight. So we'll transition into department head updates, uh, grant updates. I don't, I'm not gonna call you out by name. Anybody that wants to come up and say something, it's your option. <laughs> Just a you know, couple that are, are grant related projects um, uh, on tonight's agenda. You do have uh, the subrecipient grant agreement with the BP Restore mm -hmm. Act Bucket One, and uh, that that is uh, an, we now have a project number, and now we we have money that's officially if, as long as we sign the and approve the agreement. Uh, we are in the midway process of uh, selecting the design team. Uh, we, we went, uh, the, your, the committee that y'all appointed uh, went through the first pass and, and now we're calling in for interviews starting on Friday and hopefully our goal is no later than the second meeting of August to have a recommendation to council uh, for a firm to be selected as well as you will have the recommendation for the grant administrator. That RFP was a little bit easier. We had one respondent and it just happened to be the, the folks that we already have under contract for grant administration. So I, I think we've got a good relationship there. Um, last uh, meeting, you approved the two TAP grants. Uh, we're having pre-construction meetings this week, and one of the contractors wants to get started a week from the day on the 29th. So we're excited about that. Um, and just we do have the North Mobile drainage project on tonight's agenda. And uh, the downtown traffic and pedestrian safety is out for advertisement as well as relating to what we just spoke about, we do have the bulkhead repairs and improvements at Fairhope Docks out for advertisement, so you'll be seeing those in the August meeting. Do, do want to make you aware of, and I think you've seen, all of you have seen some email traffic. I know just by coincidence, Mr. Boone and I went out and looked at a few sites on Pecan Avenue before the little tropical event that we had. We've got some systematic drainage problems out there, um, and, and as I probably stated in my response is some of them are, well, a lot of them are self-created by development, re redeveloping lots that where there was traditional drainage that somebody thought it was a great place to put a garage and you know, water tends to want to keep going where water has historically gone. Um, but, but that is part of the challenge of, of a, an established area that's going through redevelopment. Um, you know, here, here is a reality that we've got to account for from a public works standpoint is if you know, the house that is replacing the house that was torn down has 50% more rooftop or, or impervious surface. You're correlating 50% more running off uh, forever, practically. So when folks say, well, it used to not be that much water coming through, that's, that's, that doesn't mean that the rainfall data has really changed. It means the runoff uh, uh, coefficient of impervious to pervious surface has changed. And, and that's definitely changing in our older areas of town and everything else and, and uh, you know we have abilities to evaluate and, and, and I am looking at uh, Pecan Avenue as a holistic as well as, a, as, as spot areas. Uh, there are some small things that can be, do, can be done to give relief but ultimately some bigger things have to be considered and, and we're going to uh, bring you back some options and discuss what, the, what, what uh, a systematic way to hopefully address that because uh, it is from almost to the the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill, there are several areas of problems and, and frankly, they're not going to get better. Uh, they're just not uh, because uh, uh, we now have new existing conditions there. But I do wanted you to hear this as well as those that may be listening and watching. You know, we're cognizant. We, we, we you know, I do, if I had the ability to stop water from running through somebody's backyard, I'd already snapped my fingers and done that. It doesn't work that simply, but we're, we are listening. We are talking. We are, are looking for ways to, to make the situation better, and it can be done, but uh, as Richard Peters might say, sometimes it takes a little time, and sometimes it takes a little money, and sometimes it takes both. But I did want to make you aware that we're, that's an area that has some re repeated complaints that are relatively new, and uh, we are trying to address it. The other thing to keep in mind, on, on Friday, uh, it appears that we're going to take ownership of the K-1 Center. Uh, that means that at least from a mowing and building maintenance, when I say building maintenance, kind of a campus security standpoint, that's going to fall on public works. Uh, we'll kind of keep you updated on, on, on what level of uh, impact that has on our current, you know, uh, horticulture and landscape mowing staff. Um, and, 
you know, we want to keep it, even though it, it may not be in a function use, we want to keep it looking as attractive as we can. So we'll kind of keep you abreast of that. And uh, at this point in time, we're not proposing or anticipating any budget impact. Uh, but a year from now, when we've had it for a year, we probably can better define if, if, if we need to add a mower or something like that. But uh, that's, why, that's what's going on in Public Works, and, and we're just going to keep trudging along. So thank you. Is Any questions? Is that it? That's it. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Bishop. Okay, so I uh, wanted to let you guys know that the farmer's market spring summer season concluded last week. It was very successful and glow in the park is this Thursday rescheduled from tropical storm weather a couple weeks ago at 8 p.m. at Fairhopers Community Park sponsored by the city and the downtown Fair Business Association. Lego 2 is the movie, so it should be a pretty great night, especially with this little bit of a cold snap we've got coming. Um, and I wanted to give a major kudos to Paige Crawford for making these events so successful and look so effortless. They aren't effortless, but it's her hard work and her dedication that makes it that way for us. So we're really, really proud of her. Um, and then also wanted to mention that the 125th anniversary is this year. We're doing that a little bit differently than we have previously looked at things. We are going to look at the history of Fairhaven, but we're also going to look at where we are today and where our citizens are today. So we're asking citizens to submit their stories, uh, their Fairhope stories to us in 300 words or less with a photo if they'd like. We're running that on our website. So at fairhopeal.gov, the, on the front page, you'll see 125th anniversary. Click on that and you can start to see stories populate from our citizens we'd love to have anybody's story of fair hope we've actually had people from birmingham and from out of state reach out to us and say hey can we give you your our fair hope story we know we don't live there we've said yes because it's pretty interesting to see those perspectives it's a really great snapshot of where our community is right now um, so i would also encourage all of you we would love to have your fair hope stories uh, to to really enter into that and maybe in 25 years or 50 years somebody can open that back up and look at it and say hey this is pretty cool so that's it Thank you. Thank you. So, good afternoon, Council. Uh, I don't have any agenda items for you today, uh, but two brief announcements for you. One, I uh, wanted to advise the Council. Uh, Hunter Simmons will be starting a week from today as our, uh, as our City of Fairhope Planning and Zoning Department. He will be the Planning and Zoning Manager, so we look forward to welcoming, welcoming him next week. And uh, he has the fortunate, he's fortunate that he's starting on one of those rare five Monday months where we have an entire Monday with no meetings. So we'll welcome him aboard next week. And just remind the Council and everyone that prior to the August 5th Planning Commission meeting, we will have a Planning Commission work session to discuss the Greeno Road corridor overlay. So we'll have about one hour to go through it in great detail. Then we will have that same item will be the first item on the agenda of the regular meeting. And so we will ask the chairman of the, uh, we'll ask the chairman of the Planning Commission to allow a period of public involvement, not a public hearing, but a public involvement uh, period of time to pose questions and all, uh, pose questions and comments regarding the overlay. So uh, thank you, Council, for letting me make these two announcements. Thanks, sir. And he, he, you also went into a little bit more detail during the director roundtable um, and did a, went through the slideshow, which is available online right now if you go to the planning department <coughs> and uh, you can look at the whole slideshow. Yes, and thank you, Mayor. And so uh, under the city's website, so and we'll, I'll just step everyone through under the city's website under departments, if you look at planning and development services, and then if you go to the planning and zoning and some of the some of the spaces lay you go directly to it but the to, the way to find it is to look for the planning and zoning specifically look for planning commission and there will be a view agendas and a view agenda and minutes the work session has a standalone section so that way it can be easily more easily found and also the slideshow that we'll present during that meeting. A draft of that slideshow is already posted for anyone that would like to see it prior to the meeting. And so that can be downloaded. Uh, because the meeting agendas tend to be quite lengthy and are difficult to download it, we want to uh, make it make a standalone item to be easier to find. When did you say the, the date and time of the work session meeting? Yes, sir, Councilman. That will be uh, Monday, August 5th. The regular meeting starts at 5 p.m we'll have a work session beginning at 4 p.m. Welcome. Good evening. 
Um, I've been working with our local banks on um, getting some interest. So when I came in, that was one of the first things I started looking at is, is all our bank accounts. And um, we had half our reserve was in one bank that was put out as an RFP in 14 at 60 basis points. It just could be that the turnover, nobody really looked at that. And so that was one thing that, you know, I looked at. Um, our operating accounts were at BBVA Compass, and um, I was able to um, negotiate with them to get that interest rate up. What they were doing was um, just waiving fees. And so what I um, got in place now is we're getting paid um, two and a quarter percent on the funds. Um, and then I've set there's part of the rules is they're setting aside um, two million dollars in a non-interest bearing account, which offsets the um, fees. The fees are running about forty-five thousand dollars a year, so it, that balances out. And then um, the reserves that I put out for quotes, I got um, Centennial Bank had the best offer at ninety-one ba ninety um, excuse me ninety-one day T bill plus twenty basis points. And as of the rates last Monday, it was right at um, 2.31. And they put a floor in there, and that's, that's really this market right now. It's hard to get a floor, but they put a floor of 210. So if rates go down any, which that's where some of the bankers are thinking, um, the lowest will go is over the next three years is 210. Um, so the net effect um, is going to be about half a million dollars in interest earning um, that I'm putting in the budget for next year. So. Um, I've been working on these kind of things. I'm just trying to find little things, and to me, the, our, our money is low-hanging fruit. What we can do with that is to be able to buy police cars or employees and those kind of things. Kim, I think that's fantastic. That's, that's a lot of money. I mean, low-hanging fruit, but half a million dollars is yep. a huge amount. So, well done. Yes, indeed. <laughs> And I've got just the place to spend it. <laughs> I know you can't do anything about time, but, but money-wise, no kidding, really. We, uh, the next budget cycle, we're going to try to promote more personnel. We're going to try to get some expertise, and, and, and we need that. But the, uh, the, the, oh, the Barry, you know, came through. We, we had a pretty significant rain event. We, reported close to 250,000 gallons of overflow in, in the system and it was throughout. Uh, we're, we're doing some smoke testing, trying to be pretty aggressive in a couple of the areas where we, we wouldn't have anticipated that much flow to start with. But there are some manholes that we have uh, found that have some breaches within them that we think the water was well above. and. And, I, and cause some obvious problems. And we'll we go through those locations and try to seal those up. And we may eliminate or, or do some pipe bursting or something like that to eliminate manholes out there altogether. But we're, we're still evaluating all that. We're, we're working on it. And uh, we feel like you know, some of the side stream storage projects would have helped offset some of those issues. We feel like, you know, additional personnel would help give us an opportunity to evaluate these systems quicker and, and in a more, you know, expedient manner. But those are the issues that will come up during the budget process and we'll look toward, see how we feel about all that. But anyway, do y'all have any questions? I've got one. Yes, sir. Concerning the sewer spill <laughs> right. we had recently. Uh, what's going on? How come nobody's being notified that there's a spill? The SCADA system and everything we have in place that's supposed to note be a notification system. This is the third one, as I recall. That nobody's being notified. They just keeps running because nobody knows about it. I can understand a problem. What I don't understand is why the notification system is not being done. When those high water levels hit, somebody needs to be notified so that we can get something done to bypass that system. Which notification process are you talking about? You're talking about I mean, the I'm talking citizen? about the station that overflowed. Right. Oh. Over, 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 we had it was overwhelmed because the pumps went down. Well, one of them, the Twin Beach one, in that example, the, the transducer floated with grease and other material that was caught up into it, and, and it, it just didn't even ask the pump to come on, much less alarm anybody. The control system was 
active, it just was inactive due to what was caught up in the, the components that control the bot or the wet well level to start with. So what do we have a plan so that that's not <clears throat> going to be a problem? Again? Yeah, the people we're going to hire to to better manage these things are going to give us the support that we need to monitor that better. That's and, and, and I'd that's be part happy of it. to and start then, hiring now if that's okay with y'all. But but we need more expertise to be able to you know 80 lift stations in the system Absolutely. somebody needs to go look at these things we've got one electrician we've got one pump guy i mean it's just we, we need more depth and, and this is not something we hadn't mentioned before but you know we just need more depth and, and we're happy to do that but if we got to go to the and this is part of the whole process and i'm not down in anything i know the processes are set up for municipalities because this is the way they operate but when you have to get personnel board to approve a position and a, and, a, and a gap and then you get get council to approve the whole thing again and then you go out. I mean, it, it is a process that is time consuming on top of the other processes that are already time consuming that involve procurement. And it's very difficult, shorthanded as everybody is. And I'm not, I mean, I'm doing the best I can and I think everybody in the, every department is doing the best they can, but we add these layers of bureaucracy to an already thin employee base. And either we add to the employee base or we remove some of the bureaucracy that creates the, the problem that we find in getting anything done quickly. That's just my opinion. Go ahead and mention too that it's not, and, and this is what we're gonna do with uh, Alabama Coastal. Um, Richard Peter, Peterson can speak better to this, but the the percentage of kind of not fault, but I mean the city obviously has its you know work to do in our sewer uh, system, but it's also um, the awareness campaign that we're going to try to do a lot better with. Yeah, that will be you know pouring grease down the drain and flushing. Uh, flushable wipes, which is kind of an oxymoron in terms of it really isn't what you want to do, but they say you can flush them so people flush them. And, and, and they're, they're hard to tear apart, they're rough on pumps, and they're difficult. To answer your question about the, the SCADA though, we did put in SCADA some maintenance alarm capability where if a pump doesn't come on in, in 30 minutes, and it usually comes on every 15, there'll be an alarm whether the float system works or not. That's what I was going to ask. After all yeah, well, I knew you were, and that's why I brought it up to you, because that's what we're doing. And, and we've changed that, that with that the new style. all 80 stations, or just a few of the stations? I don't know how, and Jay may know more, but I know Jeremy was working on some of that yesterday, but the mission folks, the, the, the new systems we've got, they went across the board and did that. I don't know about our surveillance. Yeah, we, um, we're trying to get with surveillance to see if they can do it too. Uh, like Richard said, this was a Columbia monumental bad time. And we had a gentleman who knows us walk by to the very start. He never called us. And we had a red light on. People were driving by, and they never called us. Uh, we, we didn't get a call out because the transducer broke and fell and said that things, everything was all right. So when we talked to Mission, we asked them, you know, that's the one that I asked you for. We said if there's a way to, you know, turn the pumps on and get an alarm if we don't turn the pumps on, they said yes, we've already enacted that. We did that the last two days. Um, Twin Beach is done, uh, Country Woods is done, South Section Street is on surveillance. We've asked them if they can do it. They're gonna let us know if they can do it. If, if we have a, just an unbelievable failure where nobody gets alarmed out, we should at least know that the pumps haven't ran. And that would have helped us tremendously in Twin Beach. The question is, you said the light was on? Yeah, the light was on when they got that's, there. That's created by the transducer flipping up. Uh, no, it's a backup floats. The transducer said we had backup floats. The ball flips up to turn the light on for a high water level. Right. What happened was... When it turns up, there's no alarm that sets up. When that light turns on, there's no alarm that goes on. <clears throat> no, the... The, the light the, is the, the alarm. The light represents a high level. The right. light is the alarm. And that's the only one. I think no. so. No, it's No, it's not. Okay. We had we have we have we have seven points to be monitored: high water, low water, uh, electrical outlet, phase monitor outlet, and uh, now power. And there's two more I can't think of right uh, if it's not being used. All right. So when we have a backup float system that's 
going to be, or it is designed to be uh, used if everything else fails. It comes on and tells us that there's a law. But it was wrapped up in the whole thing. It, it, we bury all the rags that came into Twin Beach. It's a relatively small station. It collapsed everything. We had a guy there earlier that morning at 9 o'clock. There was no problem. He looked in the wet well. There was no problem. And then all of a sudden, there was so much weight on there. It took us, Kevin, uh, Councilman Boone, it took us about an hour and a half just to cut the rags off the transistors. I'm sorry. That's all right. And uh, it took us uh, uh, about uh, an hour and a half just to cut the rags off the transistor. It weighed almost 180 pounds. It took people, two people to pull it out. So what we did was is we bought a new system, a new transducer that sits above everything. It's a radar. So it sits completely out of the water. So the rags won't affect it anymore. We put it on about five or six of the new stations. It's not, it's not cheap, but at this, we'll pay almost anything. It's almost double the price of a normal transducer. So, I, you know, there's going to be times where we have an overflow. There's going to be times where there's vandalism. Uh, we've had people put armadillos down the manhole. We've had people put uh, other things down the manhole. And, and, you know, we respond to it as quick as possible. You know, no, these I, are, we I have, understand that. And, and, and as far as list stations go, all of our list stations that are new, we have wine diagrams for. But our older list stations, we don't have a wine diagram for them because they were put together by people at the city. And so when we do these things, we hope we test everything we can. We hope that it's going to work. But there's always going to be something that we don't see and we learn from it and we try to respond to it. And we try to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Much like the fuses that happened before. We have one fuse that, that killed us, as we all know what the wood is. And we eliminated that immediately. But we had no way of knowing that fuses were going to kill us because we didn't have a wire grain for us tell us that that's what it was going to be. So now we're, we put backup floats and every, every one we had out there, we, you know, I, I think we've gone above and beyond, but there's still things just like this. If we'd have known that at runtime was going to be an issue. There's been a ton of changes, and you guys have done a tremendous job allowing us, you know, to spend the money that we spent so far. Um, you know, nobody feels worse about a spill than I do. I take it very personally. But, uh, but, but I do want to add, just so, you know, that, that half of it is a result of the city and what we need to do. And we're going to definitely beef up um, personnel this 2020 um, cycle. But half of it is caused by folks... Uh, draining their their floods through these well, the uh, people that cause damage to our system that we like I mean, the manhole just, lifted up behind that, that's the part that we building. have to do awareness right. It, right i mean but, that's, so it's yeah, both yeah, we got to do both well and that's that, and that's <clears> the frustrating <throat> part for i think for us and i don't want to speak for everybody but for me when you when you get the calls about another sewer overflow right. everybody everybody says it's the same thing it's like you've allowed development and development causes so, and, that, and that's not mm -hmm. They, they've been they've been going on a very long time, everything. but I mean, it, we actually report them now. Yeah, I mean, no. every known is reported. All right. Well, the thing so. is, is to, to speak directly to that, it, it certainly strains the system because we didn't do anything before. You know, the current administration and the current council has allowed us to spend this money. I mean, before that, we begged for money all the time. And, you know, and I understood there's 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 a give and take to every situation. So I'm appreciative of what you've done. As a matter of fact. I just wanted to remind everybody that the new pump um, line is going to be out for bid on Thursday, and so we should get sticker shock on that. But uh, that's going to help with the bottlenecking that we're experiencing now in other locations. And once we get some bottlenecking out of town, you know, we can be more efficient. We can have some hold time uh, out where we are. And plus, we really need to work hard on getting these um, storage tanks installed because that, instead of overflowing, that would have fed directly, directly back into one of those tanks. And we would have had a separate alarm tell us, hey, just to let you know, this is filling up. So, uh, you know, hopefully we can get going on that as soon as possible. Well, and, and, I, and I appreciate that, Jay. I mean, Richard, too. And, and I know that, you know, I mean, this is something that takes time. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a big a five -year process. It takes a long time to get done, especially when you have as much to do as we do. Um, you know, the biggest critic I've got is, is she lives with me at my house, and every time we one of these is reported, she goes, what are you doing? You know, I mean, why, how did you let well, this happen again? Well, let me say this. I say we're, if, we're fixing if, it. We're doing it. it if just, if it we could, if we could just take a, if we just take a breath and think about this. When I first started working here 17 years ago, we literally could get a half an inch of rain and valley would overflow for hours. Now, I didn't. It's, it's not the answer, but the progress is being made because, as Richard witnessed himself, we didn't have any overflow anywhere until the last bit. 
we were raining for almost 24 hours before we had any overflow so we are making progress right. you know and, 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 and we've reduced overflows we're looking for but the goals being met and, and things are changing it's unfortunate that where we run over a lot of times it's in the same areas and you know and, and keep in mind that you know there are people have been in here longer than i have been and so they know if their yard starts backing up they can pull their clean out and, and i can't stop that and then by the time that's, i get out there the smoke issue. tested you're never going to find it but we can do the best we can do and um and we're going to do a couple more things over in the valley area we're going to do we have lined the pipes we've done the manholes and now we're going to go on a separate um, thing where we start lining the laterals because a lot of the laterals are homemade, as, as you've probably seen before. You know, <laughs> and, uh, and, so, and so we'll go up so many feet and that will keep, I mean, we can go down there now and we can see water coming in a lot of the laterals, you know, but the main lines are not having, and, you know, if you take a garden hose and you put 10 gallons here and 10 gallons here and 10 gallons here, and I'm already at capacity, eventually I'm going to fill it over here. Right? Uh -huh. Uh, one last thing, and unless you have a question for me, item 20 is actually on your agenda. We're being reimbursed for that. Okay. So, that um, also, want to mention too that um, we've more. we've done a real, I think, good job. Thanks to you know the internal help of updating all the progress on our website. It's under frequently asked questions, front page of the website. When you click frequently asked questions, there's one for what are we doing to upgrade our sewer system? I mean, it's extensive. I mean, there's a lot of different things that we're doing. And then also um, there is a, an article on the things that we're doing to improve the health of Mobile Bay. So w when you look at all of this, you're gonna be shocked at what has been done in just a few years. And, and I'll say that Linda Roberts got some comments, but I, I would like to say that I did see something you put out explaining what's going on. And I saw something Robert put out. And I think that both of those were very helpful in explaining sort of what's going on, what's being done to help, what the sources of some of these overflows are. And, and I think what I try to explain, at least at home, when someone will listen, is that, you know, it, it, even if we redo it all, that doesn't mean that there will never be another overflow. There are always- Absolutely. Cost. Especially, Absolutely. like we just said, 50% of it is caused by, unfortunately, citizens that maybe not don't know that you can't Leave your storm drain, uh, drains out, or your your sewer. I think they know. I think they just don't want to get caught. Well, you said one of them was actually designed to go right into it. Oh yeah. So yeah. I mean, yeah, they, you think they knew? They, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say my question is right now. There's no penalties for right. the private sector. Is that correct? Well, uh, messing around with the sewer system, basically, for lack of better. Well, what we do is is we've had uh, situations where. Uh, in one particular instance, I'll just use it for example, uh, they put um, uh, the rabbit pellets, you know, that are in kitty litter. They put it down there, and of course, it was dry when they put it in, it swelled up, and we couldn't get it to move at all. We charged them for that repair. We charged them to repair the yard, and there's a shock value in that. Uh, I will say this, in the past, we've tried to charge them, and, um, you know, it becomes a political thing that we bounce back and forth because people say they can't pay it. And, if, who do we charge? Who do we not charge? And if we're going to do something hard and fast, and we do, we'll, we'll charge people for the repairs. There was one in um, in um, White Grove that would have been upwards of about eleven thousand dollars. They put an armadillo down there, and by the time we dug up everything, replaced everything, we were out almost eleven thousand dollars. And we're going to charge a citizen that much. What I think Kevin was talking about is a penalty for a fine for right. we don't have that. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to say. We don't have that. You hook up your roof drain system right. to the sewer system, yeah. Yeah. and when you smoke it, your house looks like it's on fire. Yeah, <laughs> that type of thing. Yeah, right. we do Thank not you. have. That's what I'm saying. The only thing yeah, we that, can do right now. That to is, me, I mean, obviously we can you do can't. It. You can't do everything. Like you said, if I go out there in the middle of the rain and pull the plug and then put it back. When it's over, I'm gonna have a real hard time finding I mean, that cat. But I mean, yeah. if you want the sewer overflow, keep up the good work. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's vandalism to a certain degree. Well, and we do run into there's their plug. There are vandalism in the system to it. But my, you know, my deal. I don't know if it would help or not to initiate you know, rules or respect or ordinances. We've started before. to eliminate when we get to uh, like our people to basically. Yeah, when Dan was here, you don't want to be messing around. Right. When Dan was here, when we early on, we started. I noticed they quit cutting trees down when you find them $10,000. Yeah. To cut yeah. that tree down on the easement, I didn't like it. Yeah. 
We had a lot more support. We got a lot trees more people than than like I love trees. So I like it. I did. Yeah, I get that. Well, we're, we're involved with, we with, with the Utilities United group, and, and we have a meeting actually tomorrow morning. And I think the discussion of how do you approach private citizens causing problems with sewer inflows has been talked more than once. And, and you know, we, we do need to put together some type of ordinance and penalty for doing that. I, you know, and I'm all about forgiveness anyway, so, you know, I don't have a problem with something. I think the, the habitual offender is the one we want to make the yeah, example out of. It can be of. an escalating penalty, right? I mean, you know, because we don't like this, we don't want to, we don't want to put something out there that people can't pay and for. And people it. have a manhole in their front yard that don't realize that they've run over it enough times to where it's shoved off just enough to be a problem. I mean, they're not going to know. Yeah, I mean, you know, it but could be a hundred. The second time the they time. will. We have sewer court. You could be the judge, Jay. Sewer court. Yeah, no, so yeah, serious question. So, who came up with the the fix for the lift station at Twin Beach? I think it was, um, I think it was three of us: us, Roscoe, and, uh, and uh, Richard. And, you, and how many other lift stations? Everyone that's on mission, they, you guys were uh, twelve grateful enough to give us twelve lift stations 12, on right. mission. So those, those are twelve ones that have we been modified to do yes. what the Twin Beach now. Yeah, yes. I've, I've been getting the pages at night from them just to move around. I don't know if it'd be cheaper to put a camera on every one of them. I've set eight screens. Mm -hmm. And, and Jeff is actually looking into that. All that, it's still, you can see, are you looking yeah. at a grain seed overflow? Mm -hmm. you have somebody there. I mean, yeah, monitoring that would be problematic in itself with 80. I mean, you're not going to have to do something. It'd be less time than going out to each one. You're not going to sit 24 hours and not see it. Yeah. yeah, and so my next question, you know, Richard, we've talked about that in the budget process about adding personnel and, and engineering department and all that. You know, if there's any way to outsource any of this to a, you know, a company to come in and do any of this additional rehab study or, or anything, you know, I think the council would be more in favor of that. Well, we can up the, the, the amounts that we contract with on an annual basis for point repair and, and you know, uh, pipe lining, manhole lining. Yeah, because I don't think any, anybody is expecting you know, the, the sewer department to make all these repairs. And No, and, and we we're not anticipating that. making the repairs, but we are anticipating finding root causes of problems that um, we, we, we can then point the repair in the right direction. You know, the, the repair folks are there to, to listen to, to what we want to have lined or, or, or rehabilitated. And, and they're, you know, waiting for us to be able to, that's why we got the camera truck. And, you know, there's only so much time in the day and there's so many lines you can look at in a day. But just to give you an example of, of what, in, you know, takes a lot of time during the, the, the three weeks that Rock Creek had the one main line that was washed out. I think we responded to 15 other water leaks during that three week time frame. And, you know, it wears people out. And at one point in time, and I don't know if it was a Thursday or a Friday, but there were three people that could respond to an emergency available. Which, I mean, you know, it's just, there's, there's no doubt. That, and we, we, we're gonna have to contract out most of the rehabilitation work, but, but it's the, the, the proactive maintenance and the, the identification of issues to get these maintenance projects and technical support to do the most we can with the money we spend is the key to it. Absolutely. And you got to look at all of it to be able to do that, or you got to sense it from <coughs> lift stations that have high alarms during wet weather that you wonder where, why, why would that new subdivision have a problem, and why would that lift station be high? And then you got to go look for it. But you got to have people. You got to have, you know, technicians that understand how those things work and, and can identify that. You're, Jay, your wife interested in a grade three water certificate? <laughs> she can, might be. Well, we can, <laughs> I know better than to speak. Ask her to come talk to you. <laughs> we'll put her to work. Anyway, that's, I mean, that is what, what we're faced with. Anything else? Thank you. Good to be back after 11 days off. 
<laughs> um, just a couple things. We've got a couple things on the agenda for the breakers and regulators to um, disregard those bids and then go out for quotes. And that's after talking to the treasurer and the city attorney and their recommendations for that. Um, then I want to give you guys just an update. I'm going to have not this meeting, but next meeting uh, agenda item for uh, the design work for the new Morphe substation if we choose to go forward. But I can't present that to the citizens unless we have some of the design work done so that they know what they're looking at. And so that's going to be probably 100000 added to Stewart Engineering's five-year contract. So I just wanted to give you guys a briefing on that one. Um, well, that's everything else seems to be going okay. We the system held up pretty well through the hot spells. And more for your nickels. Um, this will be the new one behind the ABC store. Nichols oh, okay. is designed. Okay, gotcha. And we closed on that land. This, but I want to do a public forum either in the fall or the spring. But people need to know what what we're doing, and so I need to have that design work done. So we're not proposing adding the construction costs in until we get the final okay from y'all. But I need some of the design work done, and that'll be the next council meeting. Uh, any other questions for electric? Thanks. We're going to let you shout from the back to you. Oh, uh, it's all good. They told me to walk out. So. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, no takers. We'll go into the uh, looking at the agenda. Um, going through here. Uh, number five is the ordinance for sleeping in vehicles. Chief, you'll be here for that for any questions. Um, number six is, I think, the working waterfront project, which will be here. Next is police app police's uh, application for a community grant. Jessica, Chief, is that going to be one of y'all? question, Chief. Uh, Eight is the library. I don't know if anybody has talked about that, but in case we do. Um, and the nine is city authorizes the mayor to execute a 311 service level agreement. Uh, what is a 311 service agreement? This is for 311, I guess. Right. Um, is Jeff here to, to talk about that? I know he talked to me about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I was going to say. Just oh, wait, you said which which item number? number I'm just not pulling that. 311. What's the call before you did it? There we go. 911. This is the information. I know what 911 is. Yeah, this is just info for information. You hit it. All right, we'll, we'll say Jeff is going to talk about 9 and yeah. 10. It looks like it's uh, cell phones. 11 is approval of more surveying for. Professional engineering for the Young Street Community Park. Um, Twelve is the approval of selection of pain pipeline services for professional engineering for national natural gas distribution pipeline compliance. Terry. Um, Thirteen. Google Mills and Cable would provide architecture services for jail doors replacement. Seems pretty important. Um, to be All right. Uh, 14 and 15 are bid rejections that we just heard about. 16 is rejecting bid for reinforced concrete pipe for public works. Yeah, and, and let me just kind of give a heads up so we don't have to talk about the revenue. We only got one response. This is our annual renewal contract, and it went up about 33 percent. And I just think that we can do better to sit down. The worst case, we're going to come back with the same prices that did, but but hopefully we can get closer to what we were paying. And we're buying enough concrete pipe on a yearly basis to make it work there for time. So that's why we're based on the rest. But 33 percent seems a little bit high in the overall increase. Okay. Thank you. And just for the record, uh, Kevin has informed me that 311 is for non-emergency city uh, issues, graffiti, city information, you know, loiters, that sort of thing. Uh, loiters could be emergent. Um, <clears throat> all right, number 17 is a backhoe trailer. Good backhoe is it? Hands. Uh, pickleball courts. I didn't see Tom here. 
of mass. So mass is here and here. All right, perfect. Uh, 19 North Middle Street drainage improvements. You're just a superstar tonight. Uh, 20 is the City Fair of Bruce procurement of 8 inch instant valve. Okay. Oh, Jay, I'm sorry. Um, 21 is the rental, new rental facility assistant. Okay. And the replacement roof for the Justice Center. All right. That's it.